All righty. Welcome, everyone. I am Masha from the Down Syndrome Association of Pittsburgh. And tonight we have our virtual speaker series called Exploring Achieva's Charitable Residual Account. And our speaker, Jennifer Stoyer, she will be talking about how to apply for Achieva's residual funds, how the funds may be used to provide supplemental support and services for children and adults with disabilities who are unable to pay for the services or supports on their own. We'll be talking about the application itself, and we'll also talk a little bit about the Cecil and David Rosendahl Fund and learn more about how the fund encourages people with IDD to live like the boys and strives to fund items, programs, and or other supports to assist people with IDD who live in any PA county served by Achieva Support Services. And as I mentioned, Jennifer Stoyer is our presenter tonight, and she is the Community and Charitable Trust Coordinator over at Achieva. So let me take it away. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I'm going to uh, just open up. I will share my screen and go through the uh, PowerPoint for the residual program. I will take you guys to the online application um, and just visit our Achieve a Family Trust website as well. Um, and then I will go through some information regarding the Cecil and David Rosenthal Fund. Um, I do want to apologize ahead of time. I have children upstairs. I am confined to my basement um, and I keep hearing the dog coming back and forth. So if you do hear any outside noise, please, please excuse them. Um, you know, son is playing Nintendo and um, I don't know what my daughter's doing. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. And then if at any time you guys have any questions regarding um, anything moving forward, please, you know, interrupt, use the chat however you want, um, and then we'll try to address questions as they come up. Uh, so the charitable residual program is to enhance the lives of others. Uh, this is to support individuals and families that lack the resources for for somebody with a special needs support uh, that we provide supplemental supports and services for children and adults of a demonstrated need. So how it works is that Achieva, Achieva Family Trust is corporate trustee for special needs trust accounts. One of those counts is called a pulled trust. So when a beneficiary of a pulled trust passes away, any of those existing funds go into and create our charitable residual account. So since 2005, whenever we started the residual program, we have been able to provide more than $10 million in goods and services to people with disabilities. <clears throat> Jennifer, can you just make your uh, slides full screen? Sorry to interrupt. Sure. Sometimes I'm always, uh, I don't know, sometimes I'm afraid to do it because then I lose it. <laughs> so let's so see. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay, you guys can see it? Yep. All right. Let's see if I can get to the next screen. Oh, nope. That's not where I wanted to go. Okay. Let's see if I can. There we go. All right. So each fiscal year, we receive a specific amount and a percentage of what is actually in that residual account that we're able to utilize for disbursements through the program. Um, this fiscal year, which runs July 1 through June 30th, we were provided with $2 million for us to process funding through the grant. Um, the year before that, we had $2.2 million. So these funds are invested. So depending on how the market goes, that is then depending on how much we will get as that percentage of what is in that existing fund for disbursement for the fiscal year. So while the last couple of years have been pretty good for us, um, I'm not sure what that's going to look like come, you know, July 1 of 2023. Um, so, but for right now, we we have the 2 million. We are almost at, we're at a last quarter of this fiscal year. Um, and we have already spent, I think, $1.2 million right now. Um, so we still have about $800,000 for us to process through the grant between, let's see, what is this, almost March through July or June 30th. Uh, so eligible applicants are individuals 
with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. These disabilities can include intellectual disabilities, mental health disorders, and physical disabilities. <clears throat> The residual request is truly based on the applicant's need. Um, we consider a wide range of supports. We, we do an iPad program. Uh, we have camp and recreational activities that we provide services to, medical equipment that's not covered through insurance, um, home and vehicle modifications. A residual request needs to be submitted through an online application process in order for us to consider it for funding. Um, so all applications are, are completed 100% online. Only completed applications will be considered for review. While we accept them ongoing throughout the year, we do have quarterly deadlines for the submissions of those requests. So they are January 1st, April 1st, July 1st, and October 1st. Uh, so that does not mean that these dates are the last day that you can submit or the only day that you can submit. I strongly encourage applications to come in earlier than these deadlines just because there's so much involved with the request um, that that opens up a line of communication between myself and the applicants or the service coordinators or whoever else is applying on behalf of the applicants needs. Uh, when they come in at the very last minute, there's there's a lot of moving parts to it. So some things can be missed. And if it comes in April 1st and it's not ready, it's going to automatically be held until that next July 1st quarter. Um, so again, even though we are reviewing them ongoing, we have these deadlines just because we do receive such a high volume of applications. Um, right now we are in the April quarter and I already have a little over 300 requests that I'm processing, reviewing and, and submitting on a, on a daily basis. Uh, so the, the earlier that you can get them in, the better. Um, applications, like I said, received after that quarterly deadline are typically held for that next review quarter. Now, there are some situations, uh, you know, if I'm coming up on the April 1st quarter and something comes in April 2nd, but it's 100% complete and I'm still doing reviews, I will most definitely put it into that April review and have that considered. I will not have that application or applicant wait until July for it to be reviewed. Um, that again, doesn't mean that we wait until July, we do process them and we could actually have approvals come out earlier than those deadline dates. Um, I was actually just doing a couple approvals before I logged in here this evening. I did several this morning, you know, so I'm constantly in, constantly reviewing and making sure that these are out. Um, but again, we strongly encourage that they are completed prior to those deadlines. If we do need to review them, um, and if they have to have a little bit more discussion by our residual team, um, we typically try to have those determinations prior to the end of the month of that quarter. Uh, so there will be situations that some reviews and some determinations will not come out until, say, April 30th. Um, those are ones that are the higher ticket items like vehicle modifications, home modifications, things that need a little bit more understanding, a little bit more information that we have to discuss as a residual team to make the, the best determination moving forward for that applicant. Um, so applicants are eligible for requests to request funds once every two years. However, we do have, and we can consider camp and recreational activities on an annual basis. Uh, so whenever you are requesting camp or rec, it's either camp or rec, um, or you can request them both at the same time. But if you request a camp in 2023, that is your camp slash recreational activity for the 2023 calendar year. You would not be able to come back until 2024. Um, so, and we do have situations where, yes, yeah, somebody came to us last year in 2021, say they requested a vehicle modification, and within that same calendar year, they needed horseback riding. They are not eligible in 2023 for a regular residual request, which would be the home mods, the vehicle mods, medical equipment, iPads, um, but they are eligible for camper rec, so they could come in 2023 and apply for a camp and rec activity. They are then again eligible in 2024 for another camp or rec activity 
and they would then be eligible again for a, um, you know, regular residual, say this time they do need that iPad or this time they do need some sensory items, they can then apply for that at that time. Uh, we do have a camp request deadline, and that is May 15th. This is a very strict, hard deadline. Um, unlike the other deadlines, I can't really give any wiggle room. Um, they have to be in by May 15th. This way, it provides us the opportunity to review them as a team, process them, and hopefully get the funding and get everything lined up in time for those applicants to attend camp for the summer months. Some other things to consider is that we do consider emergency requests, but they are done on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, what you would need to do is contact me directly, discuss the situation with me. Uh, the application has to still be completed and ready for review. I then will present this to my managers, and then they will make the determination if it is going to be an emergent need or not. Um, at that point, then I would reach back out and then we would expedite the request and the review, um, which means that I would then send it to our residual team for immediate review and consideration. And if approved, we would then expedite the purchase of those items as soon as that approval moves through. So Achieva will complete all the purchases um, and those are done according to the approval dates. So if somebody is in need of sensory items, um, what we do is we look at the bids and the submission of su the supporting documents that were provided to us during the application and review process. Uh, we take that information and then we would purchase the items that were chosen as per those bids. Um, before anything is actually purchased, everything is confirmed with the applicant or the person applying on the applicant's behalf that the items are correct before we move forward. Um, we do ask for updated invoices whenever we are working with home modifications, vehicle modifications, uh, camp and recreational activities, um, anything that can be really paid by check, we will ask for an invoice. Um, so those invoices would be sent to me, and then we send our checks directly to the vendor. Uh, so no funds are ever actually exchanged with the family or the individual that is receiving the grant. Um, everything is paid directly to the vendor or on the applicant's behalf and sent to the applicant. Upon approval and purchasing, all receipts or copies of the paid invoices must be submitted to substantiate the purchase of the goods and services. So this is whenever we are dealing with um, a gift card purchase. We have a lot of families and a lot of applicants that come to us that have just maybe obtained some housing and are in need of some clothing or some household items. We will consider purchasing gift cards for that applicant to then purchase what needs, um, you know, what's what they need to support their needs in that house. Um, we will then ask for the receipts of what they purchased to make sure that everything lines up and is appropriate with what they were approved for. Uh, you know, because there's always situations where somebody is going to try to take advantage of of the the, the grant and, and the purchase, different things that are not in line with the approval. Um, so if we get the receipts back and they do not fall in line, that can compromise any further grants through the through the program or compromise any additional funds that we would distribute in their name through the program. So it's really important that whenever you are applying, you are definitely making sure that this is the applicant's need and what you are applying for and what you will ultimately be purchasing will be for the applicant's need alone. Uh, reimbursements for items already purchased will not be considered. So if somebody is looking for a camp, um, which this comes up a lot whenever someone is scheduling camp for their child, there is typically a fee for some of these camps. If anything is, is paid out of pocket, we cannot complete or consider that portion of it uh, for the grant program. So sometimes you might have to put $100 down or you might just have to put, a, you know, $50 down. That's just not going to be something that we're going to be able to consider. Um, unfortunately, we understand that you have to pay something to hold that person's spot so that they can attend because you have to go through the process as well for us to eventually pay it. Um, 
but other things to say somebody found out about us and they had already put in a new um, ladder or some sort of lift in their house, but now they're, they want to come to the program to get reimbursed, that will not be considered through the grant. So we will then ask if there is something else that may need to help, you know, kind of alleviate some of that funding off of that portion and then look at something else that we could pay for so that they can make sure that they can make payments to that other item. Uh, we do have information in here regarding Pennsylvania Assistive Technology Foundation, which is PATF. They are a low interest rate loan. Um, they provide services throughout the state of Pennsylvania as well, and they are disability based. Um, their loans are, I think, 3.75 for anything under, or I'm sorry, for anything over 7,000. And anything under 7,000 is 0%. So I, I add this into my presentation because whenever we're dealing with a lot of the higher ticket items like the vehicle modifications and home modifications, residual can only consider funding towards the modification portion of, say, the vehicle. Um, we cannot cover the cost of the vehicle itself we will only be able to consider funds towards the modification portion. So that still leaves families with a lot of money that they have to put towards the cost of the vehicle. And I don't know if anybody on here has seen the cost of vehicles and modifications these days, but it is ridiculous the amount of money that it is. Um, when I started in this program, I think vehicle mods were anywhere from like 10 to 15,000 and you know the vehicles themselves, 20, 30,000. Now vehicle modifications are anywhere from third or from 20 to 30,000. And as you know, the vehicles are anywhere from 30 to 60,000. So if somebody is in need of a vehicle with a modification, they are looking at financing possibly 70, $80,000, um, which is crazy. So you know, while we're only looking at that portion, there's still that other portion of the funding um, for the loan for the vehicle itself. Um, now, you can always go with the loans through, you know, like a mobility works and stuff like that. But PATF, um, they have a loan calculator. They seem to work more with the families. They do do a credit check and all that stuff, too. But I just feel like they just have a little bit more support for the individuals that we're providing services to. So I can also provide that information at the end of this program as well um, with the contact information for PATF. Uh, some frequently asked questions, who is eligible? Um, eligible applicants are individuals with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, these disabilities can include intellectual disabilities, mental health disorders, physical disabilities, such as cerebral palsy and ALS. If there is ever a question regarding anyone's eligibility, please reach out to me and, you know, we can discuss it. Um, there's always the disabilities that are kind of fine lines between like what is a medical disability and what is a disability that falls under the eligibility of residual. That's my number, the 412-995-5000. I'm an extension 493. You can always reach out and we can discuss that if there's ever a question. Uh, so what are the supporting documents that are needed? All requests require several supporting documents. We're going to go over three of them. All of these documents will vary based on the need and based on the category of the request in the application process. But these three are the ones that every application needs. And then again, whenever you select your category, you're going to get these plus maybe a couple other additional items. Uh, the first one is the letter of support. The letter is to be a professionally well-written letter by a professional that's that's providing supports and services to the applicant. Example of these professionals are supports coordinators, service coordinators, doctors, physical therapists, occupational therapists, teachers, counselors, um, anyone that is providing some sort of service to that applicant. The letter should include the applicant's disability, the need for the requested item, and how this would truly increase the applicant's quality of life. Um, it should be submitted on agency letterhead. There are so many times that, you know, our residual team is going through the application and then they read the letter and every question that they had during the application uh, process has been answered in that letter. So I really strongly 
encourage you to get your service coordinators and providers to write a truly compelling letter of support. Um, the more information that you provide to us, the better it is for us to be able to review it for the application process and the less questions that we have and we can continue the process to move forward. Uh, bids and or estimates of the items that are being requested. If anything is over $500, we require two bids. So this is not per item, this is all together. So if you're looking at sensory items and you need several different things and that whole total comes to $1,000, you will then need to find a comparable bid from a separate vendor with those same items calculated together so that we can see the cost and weigh the cost between the two. Um, now, Achieva is tax exempt and so is the trust, but not the residual program. So we really, really encourage you to include all shipping and tax and any additional fees into those bids to get the most accurate amount being requested. Um, there are situations that we have run into where we are looking at like medical beds for individuals. Um, and we didn't know this, but whenever we purchased it, we found out that there's fees to take the bed off of the truck. There is a fee to take the bed from the truck to the front door. And then there's a fee to take it over the threshold into the house. So if those things are not calculated in whenever we are reviewing the application and considered, we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to add those things on after the approval. Um, and it would be a shame because then you have a bed that's sitting or on a truck that cannot come off of the truck bed. Um, so any of those additional type of fees that that could be just, you know, all these miscellaneous things that they'd add on, please make sure that you take those into consideration. Um, some other things, you know, like I stated earlier, we've, we've done furniture for individuals that have just, you know, obtained housing. Sometimes they need appliances as well. So we want to make sure, is it a gas stove? Is it an electric stove? Is this a gas washer, an electric washer? If so, what kind of hookups do you need? Do you need the old appliances removed? So all of these things really need to be considered whenever you're looking at those bids and looking to collect all of this information for them. Because the more, again, information that is presented to us, whenever we go to purchase and make those final um, purchases and deliveries, everything should have already been taken care of and, and, cons and considered within that bid so that it makes it for a smooth process of the purchase. We do have an iPad program. Um, it is a standard iPad package with which consists of a 10 inch screen, 64 gig iPad. Um, and it comes with an OtterBox protective case. They're typically around $500. So this would be the only request that will not require a bid. However, if that applicant is in need of some sort of communication app or some sort of accessories added on to that bid, then we would need bids for that item in particular. Um, you know, it's as simple as like, you know, the prologue to go take a screenshot of that communication app and add it to that $500 amount. They're typically around like it's 250, I think. So you would then request 750 for that particular grant or that particular request, and you would get the iPad and the communication app. Uh, so the third thing is the joinder agreement. Um, this can be a very complicated, confusing document um, because it is a legal document and it joins the applicant to the poll trust. So at the beginning of the presentation, whenever I mentioned the poll trust, um, so whenever a beneficiary of a, of a poll trust passes away, those remaining funds go into the residual program. So the beneficiaries are completing the document, the joinder agreement to go into and create that poll trust. But with residual, because those funds are already in a poll trust account, we have to have the joinder completed to join the applicant to the residual funds in that poll trust. Um, so we need to have the electronic version of the document completed and uploaded to the application for review, and then the original completed in ink with live signatures submitted to the Achieva Family Trust Office. We keep that on file. So if the applicant is approved, 
we process the joinder and we keep that on file. And that again is what attaches and joins the applicant to those residual funds to make the disbursements through the program. This is a one and done type of documentation if and only if the applicant is awarded funds. You will not have to recomplete that document if you come back, you know, if, if you're coming this year for a camp or recreational activity, and then you want to come back next year and request a, you know, horseback riding or something like that, that joinder will be kept on file in that applicant's record. So whenever you start a new application, you should already see that that is one last thing on these emails that you will receive whenever you start the request of the supporting documents that are needed. If it so happens that it is needed, just reach out to me. I keep them all on file as well. So I have like a backup to my backup to my backup. So I can pull them out at any time and then attach it to the applicant's account that was created. Um, if you ever have any questions regarding the residual document for the joinder agreement, just please reach out and, and ask me questions. Um, another thing that I like to mention is that the joinder um, assists, we do ask for a lot of information, um, and the residual is a taxable grant. So there is a small percentage of the funding that will be distributed through the grant that will be taxable. Um, so we will send out a K-1 tax document during the tax season. I think they actually just went out sometime this week or last week to a lot of our residual applicants. Um, and we just you know, just state, you just take it to your tax preparer and they'll instruct you as to what to do with it. We do have a lot of families that don't pay taxes, so they may not have to, you know, process it for anything, but we do have families that pay. Just take it to your tax preparer and they will let you know how to process or proceed with that document. Uh, so how much can I request? So there's really no limit to the amount of the request, but we do ask that the applicants be, um, you know, realistic with their with their needs. Um, the larger grants are typically around ten thousand. Um, we've gone over that, and we've gone under that, because we have had pretty good years with residual and being able to have higher amounts for disbursements. We have been able to give a little bit more with these programs. Um, you know, so I would still say if you're looking at a vehicle mod and the modifications 20,000, request 20,000 through the grant. Um, but again, you know, come 2023 fiscal year, July, we may not have $2 million to be able to process for disbursements. So, you know, always have a plan. Is waiver going to contribute anything? Are we able to get any additional grants from other, um, other resources out here? Can we utilize PATF? So just make sure you have a plan to kind of compensate for any funds that may not be considered by the residual program. Um, okay, so does the residual program consider home repairs? There is always a fine line between what is considered a home modification and home repair. Um, so these are things that we will absolutely not consider and are considered home repairs for a program. So they are included but not limited to sewer lines, windows, air conditioning units, furnace installation repairs. Um, we will not do hot tubs, poles, or fences, and we will not do roofs. Um, we will not put an addition onto someone's home. Um, we will not do a lot of like the cement work, like a, um, a parking pad. Um, you know, we've, we've done some things where we've widened steps because of some gate issues. Um, we have done plexiglass windows for self-injurious behaviors. We have also done the wall padding on the walls for self-injurious behaviors. So if there is ever a question regarding if it is something that is going to be covered or something considered through the program that kind of is on that, you know, that boundary and that tinkers on, could it be a possibility it's a home repair or could it be a modification? Just please reach out to me and then we can have that discussion. Um, and I can then even take it to my managers to see if it would be something that you would consider. I'd rather you call me and have that discussion with me than going through all the work of the application, getting the contractor bids, 
going through and getting support letters and, and for you to find out it's just not something that we would consider. So just please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, we will also not pay for any individual's bills, um, such as like rent, utilities. We will not pay for guardianship. Um, we will not do burial costs. We will not do tuition or child care expenses either. Um, but some other things that we can do that we've done in the past is we have some students that go to nursing school. Now we won't pay for their tuition to attend nursing school, but we can look at their supplies to go to nursing school, such as the books, um, such as their uniforms, um, any type of their, um, you know, orthopedic type of shoes that they might need um, for those long hours that they're pulling um, for the classes. So those are things that we can look at, but not the tuition. Uh, when will I know if I'm approved? Uh, as a general rule, we try to get applications in and submit it as quickly as we can. Um, and then we try to process them within 15 to 20 days. I just like to give everybody and be realistic and kind of say, you'll find out by the end of the quarter. Um, so whenever you guys get emails that it's approved, everyone's happy. Um, so, but we do, we do work very, very hard. Um, there's just me running this program and the residual, or I'm sorry, in the Cecil and David Rosenthal program, um, you know, making sure things are processed. We just hired a full-time purchaser. He's three months today. He's been employed with us. Um, so that's working out really well. So hopefully as he gets, you know, more used to the process and more used to the purchasing we can try to move these a little bit quicker. Um, so as soon as we do get the process of the approval, um, you will get an email notification of that determination, letting you know the next steps. Whether this is, you know, send us in an updated invoice or we will be in touch with you. We will let you know what's coming. Um, it, it does take some time to purchase. So right now we are purchasing from, I believe, November and December. Um, so we are trying to work through those. We're always about a quarter behind. So we're we're really where we need to be um, with the purchasing. But like I said, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of stuff going on with these purchases. Uh, you know, we'll we'll reach out, we'll confirm everything and make sure that they're everything is right before we actually purchase the items. Um, so we, let's see what else, uh, if approved, when will I receive what I requested? Again, we're, we work as quickly as we can. Um, you know, and we're up against some restraints too. Like we, we will reach out and we might not hear back from an applicant, the family or the SC for maybe a week or so. So that also delays our process in making sure that these purchases are fulfilled in a timely manner. Um, but we, we are working as quickly as we can. So just be patient with us if you are applying. Um, but if it is something like a check uh, or something like, a you know, the vehicle modifications, the camp, the recreational activities, those are things that I do that I can process pretty quickly. It's just really these online requests that take a lot more time, like the home, I'm sorry, like the furniture um, appliances and things like that. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, and I just want to see if anyone has any questions right now before I go into our website. No questions? Okay. Great. So this is our website, achieva.info slash family trust. On here, you can see all of the different trusts that we have, different services that we provide, beneficiary information and other resources. Um, then you wanna click the charitable residual program. Here, we have all of the information that we just went over. You scroll down just a little bit, there is a brief video. And everything that we just talked about, I pretty much pulled from our online uh, from our website, just to make sure that everything is consistent with what is being presented during my presentations and what you are also reading on our website to make sure that there's no confusion. Uh, you see we have information about PATF, a link to PATF, 
or frequently asked questions. Um, some grateful recipients. I just I want to stop and just talk a little bit about these two. Um, so Mike over here on the right. Uh, Mike is from Erie. Uh, he received a chair topper from us. Um, he was folding up his wheelchair, pulling it across his seat, um, ruining the interior of his car. And like I said, he was he's from Erie, so he was getting snow and debris and everything else in his vehicle. So he requested a chair topper. And I don't know if you can kind of see it there, but he gets in the car, he presses a button, an arm comes out, collapses the wheelchair, folds it, and then puts it on top of his vehicle so that he doesn't have to worry about, you know, bringing in more dirt and debris and stuff like that. And especially with the winters that they have in Erie. Um, so those are, that's just one little thing that we can do. Um, Annabelle here in the middle, she has a port in her arm and she was never able to actually submerge in water. So she requested a uh, dry suit um, and it's something so small. It was a very, very minimal amount of funds that we distributed for this grant but it was something that she was able to then utilize to go on camping trips with her family. She was able to take a bath. She was able to go in to the beach with her family. So really, even if it's something just very small, that's going to make a world of difference, just please consider us for your, for, um, supports. Down here is a link to our joinder agreement and a link to our online application. So I just want to make sure that I can hopefully log in here. I do just want to go through the application because I found it very helpful going in and showing everybody what it looks like to help to navigate it if you are applying. The first last name, email address, and confirmation email is going to be your information or the applic or the person applying on the applicant's behalf. Once you create this information, you are going to get an email to come in here and then to log in. Was it my email? Okay. Just got a new laptop yesterday and all my passwords have changed. Nope, that's not it either. I might not be able to go in, but we'll try one more time. No, okay, I apologize. Probably should have tried that earlier, but I didn't think about it. Um, so whenever you go into the application, it is going to ask you information about um, login information. You wanna create the applicant the applicant's information first. That's the first name, last name, social security number, um, and all of that demographic information. Whenever you click submit, it is going to take you to another screen to complete the application. I really wish I could log in. I'm going to try one more time because it would just be so much easier if I can show everyone. I do apologize. Yes. Okay. It worked. All right. Perfect. So whenever you log in, first, you want to create the application, select your role in assisting the applicant, then the applicant's information, and then you want to click save. Whenever you save, this is not the screen you're going to get to, but whenever you save, you are going to go and it's going to direct you to the charitable residual account application. So you're going to scroll down a little bit and you're going to see that all of that information that you've it inputted in the previous screen is now pre-populated in this screen. So you're going to scroll down and select the disability, whether or not the applicant has a relationship with the treat achieva, um, type of residence, what type of residence that is, whether you rent or own. And then here is the categories, the camp, rec, professional services, home modifications. And we also have subcategories too. So if you're looking for sensory items, you want to click product and supplies and then do your drop down to sensory items. 
or you might want recreation and you might want to do some horseback riding. I strongly suggest not to select other. It The system thinks you're, you're asking for all this extra stuff. So you might get an email that says, please submit the letter of support for products and supplies, and then please sum submit the letter of support for other. You do not need to do that. So just do not select other because then it completely confuses everybody. But if you are requesting two things at once, we will accept one letter that encompasses all the information for both the need for the sensory items and the horseback riding. So scroll on down the amount of the requested um, items would be what you are getting from the bids. So if the bids reflect $1,500 for horseback riding, you want to put that $1,500 in there. If it requests $5,000 for a medical bed, that is where that money or that requested amount goes. Uh, these next sections, please complete, please explain how the product will, and service will provide quality of life for the individual. How long is it expected to last and will it grow? The system will not let you move forward until these items are completed. So make sure that you put something in there. Um, moving down, who all is recommending the service for the applicant, select all that apply. A suggested vendor is going to be most likely the lower of the two bids that you're obtaining for, for the program. So if you are looking at something from Mobility Works for a home or vehicle modification and something from Keystone, you want to put the select suggested vendor in there. If there's a relationship, mark relationship. Um, total number of persons in the household and total household income. So if there is an adult with a disability in the household, we include their disability income and the family, the parents' income. Um, so this encompasses everyone. You can see that we do the over 200,000. Um, so just make sure that you were just providing us with as much information as you can as to why you, you need the services and the supports through the residual program to support that need through the grant. Uh, any benefits that the applicant is receiving, just select all that apply there. And what other funding sources have been explored? So this goes back to whenever I was talking about, you know, getting waiver, um, getting PATF involved, other su supporting services that would be able to assist with some funds. Everything would go there if you've explored that. Even some camps even provide some sort of scholarship fund. I know if you're looking at something like the Woodlands, they do a wonder fund, um, which they might take a percentage of what that total is to be able to provide like a small scholarship for that applicant to attend. Is this in the applicant's ISP? And then the individual completing. And then you want to apply signature. So once you apply the signature, you will then come to this screen here where it says applicant information. You will see the residual request is in progress. And then you will have a list of the items that you are looking for. Um, so this one says two bids from two separate vendors, a letter of support, signed on letterhead from a professional, denial from insurance, and then the joinder agreement. This is where you will also submit the supporting documents. So you will click the upload and then you can select a file. You can drag and drop it right into the box. Um, two things that we cannot accept are links to different web pages because they expire and they just don't transfer over um, an email. So if you were pulling something from an email and then uploading it into this, I cannot open it so it doesn't exist. So the best practice were to be is to like scan something um, or if it isn't an email, download it onto your desktop um, or, or put it on into a separate file so that it can then be attached and uploaded into the screen. You will then see as it is uploaded, it will go from the status over here from, you know, started to in progress to submitted to completed. You will also see under uploaded document for application, you will see what you have uploaded. So as you upload, maybe the joinder agreement, the joinder agreement will just reflect as well, you know, that it's been submitted so that you can then see there. 
you you do not have the ability to delete. So if you accidentally upload something incorrectly, just reach out and I can go in and remove it. I can also, you know, manip manipulate the application. So if there's something that you need updated, again, just reach out and I can help you. And then here you will have your applicant list. You will have the running list of those applications that you have started and their status. So uh, I know a lot of supports coordinators that I work with, um, you know, they, they could have multiple people and multiple applications at one time. So this would be the list of all of them right here. Um, so that is it for the application process. Are there any questions so far? I just wanna go over a little bit with the Cecil and David Rosenthal Fund. Um, so Cecil and David Rosenthal, lived in our group homes with Achieva um, Community Living Supports. Uh, Cecil and David resided in the Squirrel Hill neighborhood and they their lives were tra tragically taken during the Tree of Life shooting. Um, I believe it was 2018. Since then, Achieva was, was named um, was named for contributions uh, to donate money in their name. Uh, so Achieva received a lot of donations from different countries, um, from people all over the US. Uh, and whenever we received these funds, um, the family and the board of trustees for Achieva decided to utilize the funds that were contributed to Achieva in name and in honor of Cecil and David Rosenthal. So by doing that, they created the Cecil and David Rosenthal Memorial Fund program. This program is a little bit different than the residual. Um, it only supports specific counties within the state of Pennsylvania, where Pennsylvania supports all of PA, or I'm sorry, where residual supports all of PA. Um, there were only specific counties that we are able to, to provide funding to. Um, I know there are Allegheny, Westmoreland, Beaver. Um, I think it's Crawford. Um, I have the list. I will pull up that too in a second. Um, but there's, there is a list that I'm going to share at the end of the program as well. Um, with some frequently asked questions for that that I'm still kind of working on, but I feel like if you guys are interested, I can definitely give that to you as well. Um, but the program is designed to support community engagement and activities. Uh, the applicant has to have a disability of an intellectual or developmental um, and or autism. Uh, so activities such as Kennywood Passes, recreational activities, gym memberships, iPads for communication. We've just done two hearing aid approvals uh, for this program. The one was, was an older elderly man who was, he couldn't hear. So people were thinking that he was being rude and belligerent and he just couldn't hear and he was getting into physical altercations and it was just really, really bad for him. So that increases community engagement because it opens up his world to being able to talk to different people and to communicate effectively to, you know, take down that barrier. Um, so again, if this is something that is falls in line with something that you would like to apply to, the application process is very similar, similar to the residual. They created this based off of the residual process and all of the supporting documents are just about identical. The only thing you do not have to um, provide is the joinder agreement. So if you're applying for this, you need bids for the items. You will need a letter of support and you will need the completion of the online application. Um, again, it has to be something that promotes person-centered planning, um, promotes community engagement. I mean, we've even done bus passes for people. So as long as that is getting that individual out in the community, um, and the whole idea of it is because Cecil and David were so 
so involved in their community. I mean, they could walk down the street and everybody in Squirrel Hill knew Cecil and David. Um, so it's really important that we continue to love like the boys and live like the boys, because um, that's, you know, the motto of, of the Cecil and David Rosenthal Fund is to continue that engagement with the community and to continue to be out there and love and to, you know, spread that. Um, so again, I oversee this program too. So if anyone has any questions about this program, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and I will open up to any questions that anybody has at this time. I have a question about um, camp coverage. This is sort of a new thing for me as my mm -hmm. daughter's school age. Um, I don't even know where, I mean, I've tried to research. I don't even know where to start. So in terms of a, getting bids and B, just knowing what resources are available. You know, I don't know if you could recommend places to look. We're already signed up for Camp AIM for ESY, but that's only a few weeks. So, and I think that we also, like, we could consider Camp AIM for the summer too. So if that's something that she would like to participate in, the Woodlands, um, Glade Run, I think is another camp. Jumonville is another camp, you know, so it's really depending on what her need is and what your need is too. So, but for camps, we don't need the two bids. We will just need one. Okay. Um. So just depending on where she wants to participate in that camp. And okay. since she is an ESY, we would ask, you know, ESY eligibility and make sure that that is covered. Um. There are situations too, where even if ESY is covered by school districts, sometimes it doesn't work for all families because sometimes it's half day and sometimes, you know, families have a hard time with pick up and drop off. So even if she is awarded that ESY, but it doesn't work for your family's needs and you might want her to or need her to be in something where it's a full day, you can still apply for that full day coverage through residual. Okay, great. Yeah, we're in Washington County, so I'm not, we're in Cannonsburg, so I'm not sure. Okay. I haven't found much down our way. It feels like everything is sort of north more. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and it doesn't have to be like, it could be any type of camp. Like if you have like a local boys and girls club that she wants to participate in, or, you know, just a local YMCA camp, like it doesn't have to be like a disability related camp either. So don't think that like, you know, you're limited to that either. So again, it's really whatever works for her is something that we would consider. Okay. Yeah. That's the tough thing is she, she couldn't go to a camp independently and participate. She okay. would need really structured support. So it's, you know just sort of exploring those things is and how old is she she's seven seven okay yeah, yeah she's still pretty young yeah. yeah um and my other question is would do you are there ever potentials to cover therapy that isn't covered by primary insurance and medical assistance no um, okay that's that's always a very complicated thing um what, what type of therapy so it's a, it's a speech therapy, but it's sort of a very niche type of provider, um, okay. who doesn't participate in any plans. Okay. Yeah. So, so we've, we've had that before where we've had requests for it and it was not considered, um, because there may be other providers that would accept the insurance, right. you know, and then if we open that up, then it becomes us opening it up to a lot more. And then that would be a lot of funding for speech, you know, okay. so we know that it is covered through some insurances. So we just ask, you know, for our people to actually go to the ones that are covered by that provider. Okay, great. Awesome. And thank you, Masha. I'll check that out. Any other questions? I know it's a lot of information. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's a process. Uh, we do a lot of great things. Like I said, we've provided supports. You know, close to ten million dollars since two thousand five. Um, it's a great program. It does take a lot of work and a lot of patience to get through it. Um, but if you guys ever have any questions, 
uh, please definitely reach out to me. I think, will you be sharing my contact information or you do have it? Okay. Yeah. So just please reach out, you know, it might not be anytime soon. It might be in a year from now, but just keep us, you know, keep us in mind. Yeah, I think you also answered to, you know, some of my questions were, would you recommend talking to you first before filling out the application? And you said, yes, feel free to give a call. Mm-hmm. And some of the other questions I had, you know, are there prerequisites for a camp or for the home modification? But again, it sounds like talk to you and then kind of go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I'd hate for you guys to start applications only to find out that it's not something that we would consider. So if you're kind of like going around in your head, like, oh, we could really use this home mod, but I'm not sure if it's actually considered a modification or a home repair, just please reach out. We can kind of talk about it. You know, I might ask for pictures. I might ask for a little bit more information. So please don't be offended if I keep questioning. It's just to really understand the full scope of the situation so that I can then present that to our residual team to make the best determination based on that need. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Okay, well, you're welcome. I don't know, does anyone have any other questions? I'm going to, I will put my contact information. I'll put my um, phone number in the chat with my extension. So if anyone has any questions and I guess I can give you my email. 